Hello loves, hello world. Is that right? No. Hello world, hello loves. Right, I've been inspired to make this video today because Rudolph sent me some post ABBA things to transfer for him uh, from uh, uh, vinyl to digital. And there's a couple of Gemini 12 inches there and Agnetta 12 inch. And I just thought I'd just talk to you all. It's, it's gonna be a bit of a ramble, I'm afraid, but just about how blooming depressing post ABBA solo stuff actually was um, in the 80s at any rate. And uh, I'll sort of nail my cards on the table and I'll say that possibly uh, the two most successful projects were by Frida and also by uh, Bjorn and Benny who did chess. And uh, yeah, uh, and I think, you know, probably the world could have just done with those, really. So yeah, um, in this video you'll probably learn a, how not to light a video, because for some reason or other I was all nice and bright and everything and now I've gone all really dark and horrible um, and underexposed. And B, uh, you'll probably learn a little bit about the mentality of the music industry at the same time. The music industry is essentially uh, basically run by a bunch of sheep that just follow one another and they're herded around by um, a, a, a sheepdog that basically uh, just knows one or two things. Uh, well, let's say you know this. Um, the an analogy is breaking down just a little bit, but you know basically there are one or two uh, sort of uh, givens in the music industry. We can't be too radical. Neither can we be seen to be untrendy. So. Uh, Anyone that wants to be a little bit radical ends up sort of on the 10 o'clock in the evening shows by, you know, uh, in the 80s, it would have been by the likes of John Peel and Annie Nightingale and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the chart shows and, you know, breakfast shows and stuff like that were basically, uh, it has to sound familiar, but it cannot be, uh, the music industry cannot be seen to be doing the same thing that someone else was doing last week. So if we go to the end of ABBA's career and we look at uh, some of ABBA at their worst, let's take a song like On and On and On, shall we? I've mentioned this before in my uh, review of Super Trooper for my Magical Musical Moment series. So go and find that and I'll talk about it a little bit more. But essentially it's what's known in the music industry as a pastiche. A pastiche is basically a kind of mock-up version of a style. Okay, so if you imagine that there are real rock and roll get down heavy metal groups like ACDC and Iron Maiden and stuff like that, which are actually quite popular around about 1980, um, they were sort of enjoying a bit of a resurgence and that sort of continued until I suppose, you know, you're looking at like 1985, something like that. Um, where you know that that sort of there, there was about five years where those bands like Aerosmith and people like that they were making a bit of a comeback as it were uh, from sort of you know the the mid 70s uh, where suddenly disco became more popular and then punk and then suddenly those heavy metal bands sort of came back as it were and um, yes so I suppose ABBA felt that they had to sort of cotton on to the bandwagon a little bit. This is the sheep, basically. It's what's trendy now, or the sheep dog. Sorry, I'll get my metaphors right and my, my analogies right. It's like the sheep dog, which is, you know, the, the trends, basically. And ABBA, I suppose, felt that they had to follow one. And ABBA, as a, a group, as a live performing act and everything, could rock and roll. You know, they really could rock and roll, but it never successfully came out on record um, 
you know, and, and I think, you know, some of their songs such as, uh, what's the one I'm thinking of, Watch Out, for example, which, you know, was again a sort of heavy metal-ish kind of uh, pastiche, again, uh, was, you know, it, and it just turned out a little bit embarrassing, really, you know, um, and, sorry, if you saw ABBA performing uh, on and on and on on shows like Dick Cavett and other TV shows and stuff, there they were in their sort of trendy but nice clothing, you know, Frida in a in a purple and Agnetta in a pink, and they were doing this sort of <laughs> and Bjorn in his you know in in his little suit with the short collar and the and, and the tie and everything doing this <laughs> and it was just embarrassing and the song was no good anyway at least by our standards somebody else could have released it and uh, you know uh, people would have said oh that's absolutely amazing but by our standards I don't really think it was any good. It was badly recorded, badly edited, and uh, yeah, um, the least said the better. So that was ABBA at their most depressing. Now, throughout the 70s, as you know, again, this is something that I've talked about before in one of my Hi-Fi Myths videos, but there was this uh, recording technique which basically uh, rather than having people standing in the same space in a studio, they put them all in booths, vocal booths, this booth, that booth, the drum booth, whatever, um, and the, the musicians felt quite isolated, but the idea was to try and stop uh, one instrument leaking onto the track that another instrument was playing on you know you didn't want to hear uh, an acoustic guitar somewhere buried in the background of uh, of the drum track for example and uh, I think um, I think it was Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here album I think they were having an awful lot of trouble with that and it was causing a lot of tension um, with people so what so what tended to happen was that a lot of instruments ended up being plugged directly into the mixing desk so that then any acoustic kind of reverb and stuff like that was all put in later and bands didn't like it on the whole oh what happened there sorry i went a bit uh funny there um yeah i had a problem there bands didn't like it because it meant that they couldn't really communicate with one another. Um, the engineer ended up sort of having to mock up a mix so that they could hear themselves with a little bit of reverb and stuff on in their headphones. And, it, you know, it was all a bit of a mess. And then in the early 80s, along came a studio called The Townhouse. And that uh, studio was basically uh, very very carefully designed so that bands could play together and uh, the reverb and stuff was not overtly uh, too much you know think about you know some of the Motown groups of the of the 60s where they're kind of drowned in reverb you know and you know think of the wall of sound which is basically a whole ton of reverb and um, and, and that is created by the studio space that they're in because th there wasn't very much in the way of after effects that they could put onto these things so you know it basically all had to be balanced out and worked out and then recorded as one thing basically um, not a lot of multi-tracking going on but by the 80s we were on 48 track by then um, so this studio space in the townhouse was basically uh, intimate enough so that bands could sort of interact with one another. Didn't have so much reverb on it, but what they did was they played a little bit of a trick on them so that, you know, when they walked out of the studio and into the foyer and stuff, that was sort of padded with carpets and God knows what else. So it sounded really dull and, um, and, and unreverberant. And the minute that they went into the townhouse studio area, the recording area, then it kind of, um, 
it, 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 it sounded far more reverberant than it actually was. And uh, in that studio, uh, a, a chap called Phil Collins recorded a song called In The Air Tonight. And that had some really thunderous drums on it. Now, coupled with that, there are a, a, a couple of instruments that were ubiquitous to studios at the beginning of the 1980s. One of them was the Yamaha DX7 synthesizer, and the other one was the Fairlight synthesizer. The Fairlight synthesizer was absolutely horrifically difficult for anyone to program, and uh, you know, really hard to use and whatever. The DX7 was a basically a portable synthesizer that, uh, you know, people could lug around, carry around, whatever, and it was, you know, it, it was de rigueur for bands to have one. Uh, obviously, yes, there were other synthesizers being used with, you know, Roland's and stuff like that, that were all uh, pretty much, you know, the Juno 8, I think there was, um, in, um, in the 80s that, figured a lot on the Human League's Dare album, for example, and Korgs and things like that. But essentially, uh, we are talking here um, about, you, you know, this DX7 and this Fairlight synthesizer. And between the two of them, oh, and there was something called the Clavi something or other as well, Sinclavier, the Sinclavier, that was another one that was that was also extremely popular, whatever. And between the three of those synthesizers, then the DX7, the Fairlight, and the Sinclavier, um, you basically had a, a whole barrage of synthesizers and a myriad of drum machines that basically all worked sort of via uh, this uh, what's called MIDI. Now MIDI is a way that instruments can be connected up to one another so that they uh, they can synchronize with one another and you can play for example the piano on a piano that's connected up to a, a, a little MIDI instrument box or another synthesizer via this MIDI cable thing and you could have strings going as well you could have drums locked in time with with that and you, you know it was you know pretty um, uh, for the time miraculous and because it was trendy because you had the sheepdog that basically said you can't have a studio that doesn't have anything that is worse than another studio worse in quotes than another studio because when you think of like like a, a sort of late 70s Kraftwerk or Gary Newman or whatever you know those synthesizers by and large would have been played by hand they were impossible to tune and to keep in tune. And um, yeah, basically there wasn't an awful lot of, that. There, I think there was a communication standard between them, but it wasn't very good. And MIDI was an awful lot better. So between that, you had these, these sort of clashing reverberant drum sounds that actually take, you know, a real drummer to be able to play but the, <laughs> the idea was that suddenly all these drum machines were mimicking that um, uh, that reverberant sound basically and a whole load of other studios had to be able to reproduce that same sound and what happened was that everything became pretty much samey. Phil Collins was everywhere in the in the mid to in, sorry, in, the, in the early in fact, throughout you know virtually all of the eighties, you know he he was absolutely everywhere. He's apologised for it actually. Uh, I think tongue in cheekly because he obviously made a lot of money, got a lot of work, um, and so it, essentially you've got drum machines that were drowning in reverb, sounding like tin pots because they weren't very good. The samples that they used were not actual real human beings playing drums the way that you would have now. If you go into Logic, you'll find that, you know, e even if you've got a, a drum machine mapped out on a keyboard, it is pretty much a recording of somebody actually playing drums. Um, it, it'll never, it'll never uh, replace the real thing, but it's uh, one heck of a lot better and a lot more natural than, um, uh, a lot of the 80s groups and yeah um, into that mix you've got the split up of ABBA 
And sadly, ABBA as a phenomenon, I think, were never the same. If you took one of the um, one of the elements away from it, then it's almost like um, the other three bits, as it were. You know, you take take Frida out of it, and then Agneta, Bjorn, and Benny have to somehow overcompensate for that. And you know, Abba's music was a a very delicate mix of sadness and exuberance and happiness. And usually, the happiness kind of outweighed the sadness because you know um, I mean it was Paul Weller who said I'm only sad in a natural way and um, yeah um, it, it it kind of you know Bjorn and Benny themselves kind of didn't really function without the two of those girls um, and you know essentially Frida could just about survive on her own. I think she's got enough character and charisma, but Agneta, poor love, was absolutely drowning. So let's have a look at some of the things that came out in the 1980s. I don't have all of them, so I'm not going to, um, uh, I, I, I'm not going to sort of pretend to be an, an absolute authority or whatever, because I, I, I don't have them, but you know, let's just, let's just have a look. Okay, the first post ABBA solo project, and I think it really was post ABBA. This was 1982, yeah. So it, it it would have been the singles. The first ten years came out uh, a few months after that at Christmas 1982, but this was already out. And this is Frida's something going on. Surprise, surprise! You know it's produced by Phil Collins. Phil Collins, who at that time was absolutely everywhere, and you know, he had just sort of been at the forefront of this, you know, massive great drum machine, or not drum machine, but drum sound in the townhouse studios. This was recorded in Poland, in, in Polar Studios, which sort of predated the townhouse, I think. Um, and so uh, it was a case of, I think, you know, recreating uh, his drum sound. And it worked really successfully on the title track uh, which is essentially I know there's something going on at the beginning of side two um, you know that is Phil Collins you know at his best with his drumming um, and you'll hear exactly the kind of sound that I'm talking about there um, you, you know it, 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 and, uh, and what actually happens is that you do get the the presence of the drum kit you get the you get the muscle behind it and everything um you know drum machines and things can't recreate it and thankfully here on this whole album we have got a pretty much you know varied album it's not all uh, sort of crash bang wallop of of Phil Collins <coughs> And uh, there are a lot of other songwriters uh, basically represented on here. Um, and in fact, I think Phil Collins is only represented on one of these songs, uh, which is You Know What I Mean, which was a cover version of this, one of the songs that was on uh, uh, his whatever album that was that Frida, Frida really liked. I can't think of the title of it now. It's got a black and white cover, I think. And it ends with... Um, it ends with Tomorrow Never Knows, funnily enough, uh, the cover of the Beatles. Uh, what was that album called? Someone tell me. Ah, oh, I've got some light now. So yeah, um, this album works very well, I think. Um, I Got Something is a bit crash bang wallopy, bang crash, but you know, uh, there, there are songs like Strangers, like um, Threnody, which I absolutely adore Threnody. Um, the Way You Do by Brian Ferry, for example, that, you know, it's, it's just really, uh, uh, it, it speaks of Frida, you know. Frida had just gone through that divorce with Benny, and so she was feeling a bit fragile. I think she was quite nervous uh, about working with Phil Collins, 
because for her, you know, she for you know the previous ten years she'd never really worked um, outside ABBA. And as a solo artist in the 60s, she was more of a struggler than Agnetta. Agnetta had had loads of number one singles by the time that ABBA had formed, whereas Frida was really struggling. Um, and so for her, you know, she really, I think, put her heart and soul into this album and it really shows. Um, there is nowhere where overtly 80s production outshadows the singer on this album. And... That's, you know, one of the best things about it. Um, in 1984, she did an album called Shine, which was her trying to be Pat Benatar. Because by that time, I think her daughter had introduced her to Pat Benatar, and she thought, oh, that's fabulous, whatever. So you know what we'll do, we'll put on a really aggressive rock and roll chick look here, but soften it with the pink and the yellow, but, mm -mm, yeah, um, I don't think this album works as well, really. I don't really know it hugely. Uh, produced by, um, I think, Mark Brezhiki. Now, who actually produced this album? Let me have a look. I think it was Mark Brezhiki of Big Country. No. Produced by Steve Lillywhite, it says so in great big capital letters. But he, I think, had also been involved with Big Country, which is why we've got uh, a Stuart Adamson song on here, Heart of the Country. We've got, um, again, Mark Brzezicki playing the drums and stuff like that. And thankfully, you know, because Big Country had their own particular sound, which sounded like guitars playing bagpipes. Um, and you know they've managed to keep that off here i don't think it works quite as well as something's going on but then again i don't really know this album um as well as uh something's going on but again you know they had to use the famous names so you have got people like simon climey uh simon climey kirsty mccall uh who else have we got on here Bjorn and Benny had to have a song on here, but I think Slowly was originally a song for Gemini, or Gemini covered it, or something like that, basically. But it was, you know, one that Bjorn and Benny had sort of got in their archives, as it were, and they just gave it to Frida. Um, Frida actually wrote her own song on here called Don't Do It, and it's about the only time that Frida has got a songwriting credit on something. Um, but yeah, um, you know, this reads like a who's who of the 80s, and I don't think it works quite as well. I think, um, I, I, I don't think any of the songs really stand out as much. I couldn't sing you, even though I have listened to this album lots of times, I can't actually sing you one of them. Do you know what I mean? Whereas, you know, I haven't listened to something that's going on for absolutely yonker donkers, and it's, um, it's kind of, uh, you know, every song is etched in my memory, and, and you know, and I know it, whereas this doesn't quite do it for me. But it's not a bad album, and again, it's not, you know, despite the fact that it is, does read like a who's who of the 80s, it doesn't sound quite as, you know, clichédly 80s as it perhaps could do. Now, uh, and yet, uh, the following year, from something's going on, so we're now 1983 again, so we're going backwards a little bit in time. Back in time. Um, we produced this album, or recorded this album, with the guys from a 70s group called Smokey. And, uh, again, produced by Mike Chapman, okay? Um, I don't think ABBA's manager, Stig Anderson, was too... Um, was too phased out about the girls producing solo albums or recording solo albums. He was distressed about ABBA. He was hoping against hope, you know, even at this time, even in 1983, that ABBA would get back together and do something. And, you know, they actually weren't really wanting to. But as long as it was kept in the family. So this was recorded at Polar Music Studios, the same as Something's Going On, was recorded at Polar Music Studios. Um, Michael B. Tretov, the, the engineer that engineered all of ABBA's songs, is engineering this. 
Let's just see who engineered. Is that? No, it's Hugh Padgham. Hugh Padgham, who is basically one of Phil Collins' mates. Um, but yeah, it was recorded in Poland Music Studios. The executive producer was Stig Anderson. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think Stig Anderson, the, the ABBA's manager, wanted to keep it all in the family. And uh, yeah, so again, you know, we've got a, a who's who of ABBA things here so that ABBA fans don't feel too distressed like this is not such a great departure from ABBA. But the problem with Agnetta Fel Felskog is that, you know, as a singer in her own right, before ABBA, she had her own particular style and it was, you know, very weepy and uh, and over dramatic and stuff like that. Plus, you know, she could be cutesy, cutesy, cutesy. And as a member of ABBA, she kind of uh, subdued that a little bit and it kind of, yes, it showed up a little bit on Take a Chance on Me where, you know, she does, a, you know, a few sultry vocals in your ears, which is, you know, it, it's really nice, you know. Um, come on, give me a break, will ya? You know. <laughs> but here, she's totally subjugated. Totally subjugated. They've, they've made um, a, a sort of a nod They've had a nod at, at, at Agnetta's, you know, personal style um, in songs like, I suppose, The Heat Is On, which is Ab uh, which is Agnetta being cutesy-cutesy, and Mr Persuasion, which is Agnetta being cutesy-cutesy to beyond all kind of uh, paradigms of decency. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> yes, I love Mr Persuasion, but unfortunately... <laughs> you know, it really is, again, pastiche, you know. You know, when um, when Agnetta went into the studio, when they, they didn't really have a, a good idea about how to do Asta Mignana, and she went into the studio on her own one day and sang it like Connie Francis. And, you know, suddenly that song worked. You know, it's okay... I think, to use people as inspiration, you know, there was a Doris Day version of Thank You For The Music, or it's become known as Dor a Doris Day version of Thank You For The Music, where Agnetta recorded it sounding, you know, making her voice sound a little bit like Doris Day. And it got ditched, quite rightly, because it was too much. And Mr Persuasion here is too much, I think, you know. And then we've got, um, I think probably the most successful song on here is Wrap Your Arms Round Me. Um, five minutes and 15 seconds of Agnetta doing a weepy ballad. Um, the lyrics on this album are atrocious, apart from a song called Man, which kind of um, raises its head up ever so slightly. I think Agnetta wrote those words herself, but you know, wrap your arms around me as lyrically is just atrocious. And that the whole album, in many ways, is atrocious. Um, you know, rhyming head with bed. Good Lord. Good Lord. You know, um, it's yeah, basically, you know, the songwriters on here. I, I don't know who most of the songwriters are because they're not credited on the back of the album. Um, and I'm not going to take it out of its sleeve because I just can't be asked. Um, yeah. You know, and what have we got here? Can't shake loose. I can't shake loose. <coughs> that blooming great big reverberant drum sound. 1980s reverberant drum sound. But poor Agnetta, her vocals, no one is taking advantage of the fact that, you know, she has such a huge vocal range on this album at all. You know, um, yeah, what's another one? Once Burned, Twice Shy. She doesn't even sing the chorus of most of it. Basically, you know, it just sounds like, you know, she's just being totally drowned out by backing vocals. And, you know, yeah, this album's not a bad album to listen to. But when you consider the talent that is 
singing this and the potential that she has to sing on this um it's it it just sort of pales into insignificance at how bad the songwriting is and you know and, and how bad the production is you know it, it, it's just totally dated um so rudolph sent me this this is the way you are right one thing i will say people is that if you want to buy second hand vinyl try not to buy second hand vinyl that has the shop's stamp on it someone who's written some sort of catalogue number on there and someone who has then scribbled the, the the genre of the music on there right because the only thing that this tells me about that person if i analyze their handwriting it says that this person is a reasonably creative person however they are racked with anger and guilt they have um uh, very limited powers of concentration very limited powers of patience um uh, uh, and basically um you know this is you know a person who lets basically anger and sort of frustration and guilt uh, uh, rule their life basically so that's basically what that's told me here um Let's actually get on to the thing. This is a song called The Way You Are. It was basically, um, I think, a one-off duet with this bloke called Ulla Håkansson. Came from a Swedish film, it says. It's time for Sweden. Never heard of it, but, you know, I'm sure it's around somewhere. And if you want to watch it, it's on YouTube. I don't even know if it's in English, but basically, it's time for Sweden, basically. But if this is time for Sweden then poor Sweden. You know, Sweden's got a heck of a lot more musical talent than is on here. You know, again, Agneta, this great singer, this fantastic singer. No one has heard of Ulla Hankonsson, or whatever his name is. Sorry, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to be rude to you, but I can't pronounce your name. No one has ever heard of him. We've heard of Agneta Feldskoy. I can't even pronounce her name now. But basically, you know, we've, what have we got here? A photograph that is essentially mainly shadow, which is the song, essentially. When I put this on, 12-inch singles play at 45 RPM. I thought I had accidentally switched it to 33 RPM. It's that slow and that maudlin, and all of side one is essentially the extended version of the way you are. And if that's the extended version, God only knows. It, 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 you've, you've got like six minutes or so of basically this same chord progression repeating over and over again, and these drum machines going boom, 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 boom. And even where the song's supposed to pep up and liven up a bit towards the end, think about In the Air Tonight again by Phil Collins. Think about sort of two thirds of the way into the song when Phil Collins' enormous drum solo comes in and basically turns the song from, you know, a, a, a bit of a slow, weepy ballad into a faster paced, more, you know, dynamic, but still weepy ballad. Yeah. Um, and think about the lift that that gave that song. Two thirds of the way through this, we get a drum machine that is doing its best to, to sound like Phil Collins, going double, 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 but there's no dynamic range to back it up. And this is, you know, it, it, it is everything that is wrong with 80s music. When people say, oh, it sounds 80s, that's what they mean. That's what they mean, because this is just, it, it just belongs in the bin. It is that bad. It is that bad. And poor Agneta here, you know, uh, after Wrap Your Arms Around Me, which did reasonably well, she had another couple of solo albums in the 80s. Eyes of a Woman was one of them, and I don't have it. And another one, another album that I really cannot remember the title of, and I don't want to remember the title of, because, you know whoever it was that was being the sheepdog 
oh, this is trendy. Oh, that's trendy. Oh, this, and, and she just fell for it, hook, line, hook, line and sinker, and was totally subliminated on these albums. And, you know, poor Agnetta, she did nothing throughout the 90s um, in terms of uh, recording and stuff, as far as I'm aware. She may have done, you know, the old thing or two, but basically she did nothing throughout the 90s and then came back in 2004 with My Colouring Book. Now, My Colouring Book, again, you know, it's, it's her sort of singing songs of the 50s and 60s, um, maybe one or two new ones in there, but basically the 50s and 60s, the songs that she loves and just treating them sensitively, you know, not departing too much from the... Uh, original versions and stuff but basically you, you know not trying to be them at all and you know and it's her it's actually her you know you can imagine Agneta, uh singing the past I must forget the past dance with you I might what's <laughs> sorry I sounded like a right idiot there but basically um uh that's the song called past present and future that's on my coloring book and it's absolutely brilliant and you can just imagine her doing it and you've got funnily enough and yet her back and then um in uh I think it's 2013 uh she came back with this album called A which again yes it had um uh some Swedish trendy producer. I think he produced Britney Spears as well. But again, he let her shine. He let her sing. And so, again, you there's Agneta there. There's a real person that you can connect with. You can't connect with this. You absolutely can't. She doesn't even start off singing it. She joins in in the chorus. And it's, you know, it's just oh, horrid. Absolutely horrid. So, you know, leaving the girls behind for a little bit, Bjorn and Benny decided uh, that they obviously wanted to write a musical, and so write a musical they did, and uh, that musical was called Chess. And, you know, Chess has you know, just so many good tunes in it, you know. Um, when you think of a Bjorn and Benny collaboration, you, you're not actually wanting to hear the personalities of Bjorn and Benny there. You know, they are good at, you know, obviously their songwriting craft, but they're good at stepping back. You know, this is Bjorn and Benny at their best, you know, stepping back and allowing the personalities of the uh, of whoever it is that they're producing to come through, especially when it's their project, you know. Um, and, you know, Chess, again, you know, it was produced in the middle of the, you know, ultra shoulder pad, ultra drum machine, uh, pre-programmed, you know, techno babble that was everybody in the 80s saying, oh look, we've got all these synthesizers now and they can all play by themselves. You know, again, think Howard Jones, you know. You know, Howard Jones' Human Lib album could basically play itself. Um, you know, yes, that, you know, that was a brilliant album, we, we have to say, you know. Um, again, it's not one that I've listened to for, for a, a, an awful long time, but it's a brilliant album, you know. Um, but, you know, Howard Jones' personality came out on there and with Bjorn and Benny you absolutely don't want their personality on there neither have they over stamped it with you know the, the worst excesses of the 1980s in terms of instrumentation and stuff like that you know the um again you know musical theatre took a great big sort of dive up in popularity in the um, you can't really have a dive up, can you? But you know, it just it, you know, it, it had a great big resurgence in the nineteen eighties after punk and disco in the seventies. Um, you know, suddenly everyone was was listening to Les Mis, Phantom of the Opera, Cats, and basically, I think Bjorn and Benny there, you know, have surpassed. Uh, I don't think. I think Les Mis, I think, is on a par with it. But 
you know, I, I, I really can't rate anything that Andrew Lloyd Webber ever wrote. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that in terms of the songwriting that's on there, you know, it, it's just an amazing album. And I say album because I think that the the production itself was beset with problems. Uh, the plot kept changing from one uh, sort of uh, production of it to another and uh, they could never really settle on exactly what happened in the end. But, uh, you know, certainly the studio album from Chess is just absolutely fantastic and, uh, you know, uh, 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 and begs you to listen. Yes, it's got Elaine and Barbara on it. And yes, Elaine and Barbara were, you know, again, this kind of we're mature women kind of divorce papers and, you know, and, and, and whatever, you know, and ultra shoulder pads and whatever. But thankfully, the uh, the production and the music is Bjorn and Benny at their best. Talking of Bjorn and Benny at their best, one of the things that Rudolph gave me to transfer was by this group here, Gemini. Now I have to say that the only things I've heard from Gemini are this single, which I've heard twice, I think, because I had to play it a couple of times to get a good transfer of it. A song called Slow Emotion and uh, the B-side Too Much Love Is Wasted. And what is it? Again, now you see, Given that it has these wonderful names on it, Benny Anderson and Bjorn Ulvaeus. But it, you know, yes, it, the two of them produced it. Anders Glenmark here. This is Anders Glenmark. One half of Gemini here. It looks like whoever took that photograph of him, it, they took it while he wasn't looking. You know, and it's it, and it's always awful when you have these split photographs here that don't join. Look at those shoulder pads. Look at that bouffant hairstyle. Look at that posturing and the posing and everything. You know, and everything about it says, you know, oh, we're trying to be so 1980s people. You know, and again, what is it? Slow emotion is basically uh, sort of, I, I suppose, trying to be a, a, a club dancey track, but basically it has drum machines going pop de 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 pop, and every fourth beat you've got psh, 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 psh from the cymbals and a whole load of synthesizers all playing by themselves. I don't think the song's that bad, but it's just, it's, it's just drowned. It's just drowned in overindulgence, really, uh, in an effort to say, yes, we're being guided by the sheepdog. You know? Too much love is wasted. Is, you know, again, it's a mature ballad. And it goes, dum. Dum dum, ch dum, dum dum, ch dum, dum dum, ch. Give Bjorn and Benny their credit. At least they let the woman sing. She can sing. She has a wonderful voice, actually, has Karen Glenmark. But in my opinion, she has never been given a decent song. Okay. Um, yes, uh, just like that was one of Abba's sort of throwaway songs that they never fully recorded themselves because they never quite sort of uh, managed to decide on, you know, exactly what to do with it. And to be honest, in Abba's uh, incarnation of it, certainly the one that's on the Thank You For The Music box set in the um, Abba Undeleted medley thing, the words are just not English. Well, they are English, obviously. Um, and I don't mean that in a in a sort of um, you know Brexit way. <laughs> oh, it ain't English. Get out! I'll have you arrested. <laughs> I don't mean it like that. But there are certain phrases and stuff and certain words, unpredestinated, 
I think it probably is a word, but it doesn't actually mean what they actually um, intended it to mean. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just clumsy. The English on it is clumsy because I don't suppose they'd finalise the lyrics. They never put it out. And so that's, that's absolutely fine. They never put it out. You know, Bjorn and Benny, you know, English is their second language. They got away with since many years. I haven't seen a rifle in your hand on Fernando. Uh, but, you know, again, that is not particularly good English either. Um, but, uh, you, you know, it, it was just really clumsy on Just Like That. Gemini did a version of Just Like That. And what did they do? Slow it down to going on beyond backwards and just making... Where, whereas Agneta, when she sings it, even in a rough guide demo vocal manages to put some life, some cheekiness, and dare I say it, sexuality into the song. Gemini totally and utterly castrated it, and uh, it, it, it just is, it, it, it just doesn't bear thinking about. It is that bad, it's that maudlin. And I, I don't think I'd be alone in my opinions there for, for that one, I think. Um, uh, yeah, Gemini absolutely massacred that song. And that's really all I know about Gemini, really. Uh, you know, uh, uh, again, hideous examples of of basically allowing the, the technology. I love technology. I use it myself, you know. Yeah, I can play the piano just about. There's one behind me. But, you know, when I, when I record it, I, you know, cheat an awful lot. And all my other instruments and things are basically from the Logic sound uh, banks and, and stuff like that. But basically, um, in the 1980s, um, the technology wasn't quite there. And because of the huge, colossal amounts of money, far more money than there is now, it has to be said, you know, pro rata and with inflation and everything, you know, the idea of, you know, having a, a hit number one record, provided that you weren't ripped off by your accountant or your, um, or, or your management company, and provided that you stayed away from excesses of drugs and um, other sort of uh, hugely grandiose lifestyles, limos and swimming pools and, and stuff like that. Um, there's huge amounts of money to be made and huge amounts of money to be made, not really for the artists themselves. You know, obviously, if you were successful, if you were the Pet Shop Boys or Madonna, then, you know, or, or, or Prince or someone like that, then yes, there was, you know, um, it, a huge amount of money for you but there was far more money for the people that weren't actually making the music that were just directing it in the in the studios and you know for them as I said you know it can't sound too different from last week but it's got to sound like you know we're being trendy you know it's it, it and so it, this this sheepdog you know, the, the sheepdog nowadays is around in terms of, you know, that loudness button that's on, you know, everybody's blooming computerised mixers and stuff. The one that says normalise for overload protection only. In other words, make everything sound exactly the, the same volume and, you know, blast the shit out of it, basically. And it just takes away the soul and the life of the music. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, to be fair, yes, I've slated Agnetta's solo career. Not a great solo career, but it sounds a lot better and a lot more listenable than a lot of the stuff that, you know, you hear these days. Um, you know, I'm not deriding music of today because I like a lot of it, but, um, you know, there, there, there's an awful lot that, you know, basically... Uh, is basically again people following the herd people following that and 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 it's not necessarily even the artists themselves it's the people that are guiding them you know oh such and such a producer was famous last week you know and provided that such and such a producer 
let's call him Jack Jones, for example, you know, provided that his work is as loud as last week's album, then, you know, it's it, it, it'll do kind of thing. But yeah, you know, in the 80s, huge amounts of money to be made. And therefore, this following the herd, following the trend, uh, basically ended up with some really awful excesses of um, of uh, just basically people copying one another and you know it, it and you know losing the the person and 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 the people behind the actual music you know as I say out of the girls I think artistically Frida was the most successful and you know her Swedish album from 1996 Juba Andertag I think that's the last one that she's made as a complete album that's been solo. Um, and yeah, I think that that's uh, basically um, much, again, it's Frida. It's Frida. It doesn't matter who's produced it. She stamps her personality on it. And, you know, again, you know, won't let herself be outdone the way that Agneta has let herself be outdone by, you know... Uh, whoever it is that's producing it that says, you know, this sounds in at the moment. Yeah, whatever. It remains to be seen. I mean, last year we were promised a new uh, couple of songs by ABBA. And, you know, uh, I still have faith in you. And another one whose title I've forgotten because that's, a, um, that's the way I am. <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, we don't know where that is. I hope that you know, that sort of balance between, you know, the contributions of all four of them uh, can sort of rekindle a bit of the magic of ABBA, you know, doesn't linger too much on the, you know, the visitors got very maudlin and depressing in places, um, you know, and even songs like I Let The Music Speak, for example, which, you know, should should have been a really kind of uplifting number and stuff. I suppose, you know, yeah, I'm maybe sounding ign ignorant here, but I don't find it uplifting. I just find it too overindulgent for a pop group. Stick I Let The Music Speak into one of the musicals that, you know, was enjoying a, a you know, resurgence of fame, for example, in the, in the 80s, and yet, it would, you know, be one of those standout numbers that, you know, everyone, you know, encores and, and, and whatever else. But stick it on an ABBA album and, you know, it, there's, there's not enough of the four of ABBA on there to kind of gel within that album, you know. Um, so anyway, that's I've been bleating on for 51 minutes. I'm sorry if some of this wasn't necessarily too coherent, but yeah, um, yeah, if you're, uh, you know, a, a new person to ABBA, you've watched both Mamma Mia films and you think it's great, then buy ABBA's music, okay? Um, be careful about some of the later stuff, because as I say, it really wasn't very good, okay? With the exception being Something's Going On by Frida and Chess from the 80s. Um, you know, Christina von Duvermala, which was Bjorn and Benny's Swedish musical. They, they did, there is an English translation of uh, basically the songs of it with a narrative on it uh, from Carnegie Hall, I think it is, in, um, in America, Life from Carnegie Hall or whatever. Um, that, that's around and, you know, again, that's a lovely musical. But, you know, it, it's taking Benny Anderson, essentially, who was the, you know, the principal um, music writer. I think Bjorn wrote the lyrics and, you know, Benny, you know, was, you know, behind the actual music. But it, you know, God bless him, you know, at the time that he was writing that, he was in his 60s and I think he'd grown up a little bit and just said, well, look, I don't care which particular instrument people are using nowadays, whatever. This is how I write songs. This is my music. And it's going to be, you know, this what this bit's going to be for an orchestra. Yeah, we're going to have a, we'll have a band here, whatever. But, um, you know, and it's my music. And, you know, I'm not going to be governed by a sheepdog 
that was trying to herd me into a pen <coughs> and close the gate on me. Anyway, ta See you later. What's that, 54 minutes and 48 seconds? Gordon Bennett.